Hi, a warm welcome and thanks for joining us today. I'm Alessandro Vicentelli and I'm the Artistic Director of, uh, uh, and Curator of Eco8 for the revived edition of the International Triennial of Art and Ecology in Maribor. So over the course of the next two days, we have the opportunities to hear from several of the artists from the exhibition. Um, and these are being presented as hour long conversations and sessions are very much focused on their practice. And it's a chance to hear about their practice um, and their ways of working and the work that we presented in the exhibition. Uh, these talks are being recorded and streamed. Um, it's, it's fantastic to be able to do this. Um, the artists that we'll be speaking to are Emilia Scarnelita, Nina Slieko Blum and Connie Blum, Laura Harrington and Danai Stratu. Firstly, today it's with Emilia Stanalita and Nina Seco Bloom and Connie Blum. Um, it's the CODA week or the final week to the exhibition, which opened uh, on the, back in the 20th, 21st of May. Uh, uh, and there are a number of events happening as part of this final week. Um, I say these talks, which are, which are concluding uh, on the 18th of uh, July, um, these talks are part of the Eco 8 Triennial. Uh, for Art and Environment in Maribor um, in Slovenia. So the exhibition, A Letter to the Future, has thematically evolved from the plaque placed to the mark of the disappearance of the Ock Glacier in Iceland. It's a memorial plaque by the people of Iceland that marked a specific moment in time. And it read, Okjukul is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. And it was championed by the Icelandic writer Andri Snear Magnusson, um, uh, together with geologist Udur, Udur uh, Sigurdsson. And it was a, a moment in time. And I used it as a thematic connection, really, for, the, for a letter to the future um, as, as, the, 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 as, the tri as the triennial has developed. It has 26 international artists and initiatives. And one of the fun fundamentals for me is how the empty spaces of the MTT textile factory, a fantastic uh, raw industrial space, really only recently vacated as a textile factory, could resound and echo with a sense of urgency and action. And it was this conversation that I had with many of the artists, um, uh, many of the artists that uh, were invited to work there. It's been a wonderfully collaborative process, and I'm immensely grateful to UGM Maribor and the production team uh, for making it happen. Um, so I want to just recap on the format for today. It's a short introduction to the artist. It's a 20 minute presentation for the artist where they share about their work. And then it's a, a conversation mediated by me with some questions, but there's a chance here to, for, for audiences to, to ask their own questions. Um, so please, you can put them in the chat function, uh, YouTube and, and Facebook, and they'll be collected together and, and we'll make sure that they get answered. And at 11.55, 11 we'll, we'll draw this to a close and a few minutes before introducing Nina Sleko Blom and Connie Blom, and we'll follow the same format from, from uh, 12 to 1. So I can hope you stay with us for, for both these events. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, I'm now going to uh, just find uh, the introduction notes really for, for, um, uh, for um, for introducing the wonderful em Emilia Scarnalita, uh, uh, so who we're starting with. And I followed Emilia's work for, for a number of years. So it was a real pleasure for me to be able to be able to host a particular work uh, within the industrial spaces of the textile factory where we're presenting Siren Emilia. Um, it's an earlier work, uh, but it's consistent with her practice. And it, it, in a way, uh, uh, it's something that, um, uh, it's, 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 it's a fantastic practice that resonates beautifully with the idea of, 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 um, of deep listening, of questioning time and structures in terms of the way that industrial spaces and research can come together uh, with these profound ecological questions. So Emilia uh, is an uh, artist and filmmaker, artist and filmmaker from Lithuania. Working between documentary and the imaginary, Skarnaluta makes films and immersive installations exploring deep time, invisible structures from the cosmic and the geologic to the ecological and the political. Um, she was the winner of the 2019 Future Generation Prize and Skarnaluta represented the Lithuania uh, 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 22 Triennale de, uh, de Milano. Uh, she was included in the Baltic Pavilion for the 2018 Venice Biennale of Architecture. 
And her films have been widely shown at IFA, Cardis, Foundation, Centre Pompidou, in numerous collections and uh, presentations at the Serpentine Gallery um, and in film festivals around the world. She studied at the Brera Academy in Milan and holds a master's from the Toronto Academy of Contemporary Art Norway. She was also a founder of the Polar Film Club, a collective of analog film practice located in Toronto, Norway, and is also a member of the, the New Mineral Collective with Tanya Bus. Um, and I know they created a major piece of work for the Toronto Biennial um, um, a couple of years ago. And she continues to work in an exhibit internationally. And I know her most recent solo exhibition just opened in Switzerland at the Kunsthaus Pasqua in Biel titled Sunken, Sunken Cities. As I say, um, I followed her work for, for several years. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure to have her work as part of Eco Way to Letter to the Future. Um, uh, Emilia, a warm welcome and thanks for, for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Alessandro, very much. I'm very happy to be part of this amazing show and the all these artists together. And uh, like uh, in this 20 minute introduction, just uh, Alessandra wave me if I disappear with the internet. Um, maybe I could just like ex and I'm not a um, studio artist. My studio is really the world, the underwater world, the cosmic world, and uh, politically and geo power landscapes and borders kind of zones where I try to measure them with my own body or using like characters that I met um, such as or my blind grandmother or neutrino particles. So they all meet Aldona. And if Alessandro could show just a little excerpt. Yes. And uh, basically it's um it's also like will be reflections in the father work uh, connecting with um, nuclear waste strategies and decommissioning sites so it's um it's my blind grandmother who i nerves got poisoned after 1986 Chernobyl explosion, doctors claimed that her eye nerves had been affected. And we will travel a little bit in the southern Lithuania, very abstract park where you could meet thousand Lenins and Stalins. And my grandmother, it's more like a prophet, like, um, yeah guiding us through this Cold War, not really Cold War, but like a Soviet legacy, dictators and monsters, like wild. We can Let's share start. the links of all this later. Yeah. In the chat. Let's... So we're... Both dealing with uh, some serious lags. 
we also so we'll bring this to it's not I don't I think it's not gonna work. Okay, I will keep uh, talking. <laughs> Um, you can just share the links after in the chat of um, all three films. So, I have to. I have to say apologies for that. That's not working. That link is not working. Yeah, yeah. it's just 20 minutes. So it's better people watch the, yeah. Yeah, the links afterwards. after. So I think um, the Faldana's film, I, I think the works comes like poems sometimes and sometimes like novels. I mostly work with moving image for the last 10 years. And it usually involves like long term research and site specific research, interviewing, talking with scientists and soldiers. And, and I think through traveling through the world, I often understand what I just have in front of me in Lithuania, where I come from. And continuation of Aldana, I think it's uh, been T one and a half work, which I've been showing in in future generation art prize. And maybe we could share the screen of the portfolio just with the images of all the works. I have graduated in Milan in sculpture and even though i've been working this moving image i would say that i always think about sculptural aspects how people move through the space now we are on the screen we see the southern lithuanian border with Belarusia, where my grandmother is from so just an introduction of this foggy Lithuanian landscapes. And I think I will, I have always been interested in these things and issues that hide from the eye, it's like Bataille says. So later on for the Baltic Pavilion in Venice Architecture Biennial, I was working like with the sites related with nuclear waste decommissioning. And in Lithuania, we have twin sister of Chernobyl, a nuclear power plant that at the moment is being decommissioned. So for the last six years, I kind of spent time there. And I think later on, I connected, it's connected with my grandmother. Aldona. Maybe we can fast forward just to show the film. And uh, yes, here we go into the park. And I think like coming back to the sculpture and filmmaking, I feel like Filmmaking and moving image for me is like clay, some kind of sculptural pixels or neutrinos or particles that pierces through our body. And I always try to create these type of spaces or chambers where where I could guide the audience with the angles of the screen, the, the directions of the sound, trying to create these infinite experiences. Um, 
about later on. So I think, yes, yeah, Saldana and T1 and a half works relates more with nuclear waste and post-Soviet legacies, but also thinking about Cold War mythologies that I think still continues till today. I have been living for a few years in South Korea or other places, and I still feel sometimes that Cold War never ended. And I was interested in the myth, in Cold War myth in itself, what East beliefs about West and West beliefs about East. And that's where Siren Amelia work comes in the picture. Also, that started with site-specific research above the Arctic Circle in Tromso, where I graduated in my master's degree. And that was a really special research, uh, one month uh, living together with other local artists around the NATO decommissioned military submarine base. And that's where I trained my own body preparing for that piece for entire year. And that's the piece that you see in the textile factory, Siren Amelia. So basically, it's combined by two parts. First part is shot in scientific station in New Olesund, this Spitsbergen Island above Norway, very up north, where it's not allowed to walk without a rifle. So that was quite an uh, inter like really interesting experience. And the second part is in the decommissioned submarine base where I wanted to invite the viewers to see all these Cold War ruins through this new kind of non-gender species point of view. And I was interested how new plankton, new species are taking over all these Cold War structures. And that's been quite a challenging odyssey because just the moment when I needed to jump in this four Celsius degrees, black salty water. Yeah. Been an experience. Um, also while I'm talking, um, open for questions. Yeah, and I think like in Siren Amelia, I'm interested again, um, measuring these type of phenomena that happens in our world through my own body. Again, and in the end of the film, you see the last shot where this Post human mermaid leaves this artifact of almost Wi Fi waves. And I think it's like this lonely creature really sensing the world and mediating the world. It's like a mediator. And uh, just recently, I have published first monograph about this film, Saren Amelia the uh, texts by Andrew Berdini, Nadim Saman, Alison Sperling, and Roger Penrose. And Roger Penrose, who worked a lot with theorists of black holes, compares this figure, a siren, again, as a mediator between these two worlds, the classical world, half human, and half the quantum world. So again, it's a link, it's a parable, it's a mediator, a medium, trying to connect these links and languages between the worlds. And, uh, and the last uh, clip 
is from just recently I had a solo show in Lithuania in the and see that link it's a three minute um, documentation of the exhibition sorry what is the the exhibition is Shuba was this Lithuanian sculptor and visioner, an amazing artist that kind of been overshadowed over her. It's also me. the theory of the world the and the links and manifolds between these different worlds and uh, and in the um, exhibition we've seen her enlarged visionary spaceships and structures she was designing over her life while she lived in Manhattan and escaped Nazi regime from Lithuania. And currently also- Sorry, sorry just to return to the, sorry, the Kasuba yeah. one. So, so, so that was like yeah. a homage then to a, to a, yeah. a, a, a legendary uh, artist. Yeah, okay. And we had was, like 60 years old difference between us. But I think she was also one of most important artists I met. Yeah, was this mutual understanding. And she had these um, seven different perceptions of time that I also included in the film circular time, linear time, personal time, stagnant time. And I also like tried to give this perceptions the reading her texts and voiceover. Uh, Emilia, Yuri's just getting that link because uh, I know there were the three links. So we're just, we're just checking that we've got that one as well. So um, has that exhibition now finished? The, or is it? Uh, yeah. Yes, so yes. We'll, 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 try and, we'll try and share that now in a minute. Um, and uh, currently there is another new exhibition, which if you happen to be in Kunsthaus Pasquart in Biel in Switzerland, it's a major kind of survey of entire body of 10 years of my work. Here, we've just got on screen the Kasuba one, which I, 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 I hadn't seen anything of, so this is great. So it's basically this uh, large scale, six channel sculptural, installation and I use this uh, white milk ceiling for reflection. I often use black liquid ceiling to create this underwater infinity pool world. So here we traveling through New Mexico, through white sands, uh, through kind of these geological stratas of bottom of the sea and in a way yeah i would love to celebrate alexandra's kashuba's work and to invite everyone to get to know more about her work and these are excerpts of her house that's been built by her in new mexico desert she always thought about 
shell dwellings and incorporated housing in the landscape. But of so course, very it's much always, a, a you need to be there in the space. Yeah. yeah. But, but as with that, as with all of your works, they're, they're, they're profoundly atmospheric and uh, sensory in terms of the way that sound is choreographed through the space. Um, there's this sort of industrial architecture and then this sort of sensitivity in which how the human and the non-human interact with these hard industrial spaces. It's, it's unusual to get the, the, the non-human kind of the other, other boundary that uh, you absolutely bring together in a, in a way to create this kind of other, other space. Um, and that, mm. that non-human sentient understanding from elsewhere is resonates through so many of the films. Yes, yes. Maybe uh, I also forgot to mention, yeah, it's very important to this often like future archaeologist point of view, landing on Earth and seeing all these human left traces and scars, both mining sites or failed scientific progress signs or not failed scientific progress <laughs> like sites, but I often see them already as ruins and as past, such as, for example, in my film Mirror Matter, we have um, Super Kamiokande in Japan, one kilometer depth neutrino observatory, the 13,000 multipliers, photomultipliers, researching dark matter and neutrino particles, or CERN as a 21 kilometer ring that I maybe also envision already as ruin often, you know, like trying to distance from current today's world and try to see it from future perspective already as a archaeological ruin and try to reflect. It just, just to keep you with that, this idea of Cold War architecture and ruin, that experience of your own, I mean, in a way, the Cold War, um, I mean, the, 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 the places you found, the places you located in, in, in Lithuania, but also, um, you know, in Tromso, it was like, it was Cold War architecture, it was the submarine base. They're, they're kind of, the sites are, are um, you know, redolent with this idea of, of of redundancy. But, yes. But yes. But, but one of the one of the things that's so interesting is the new the newer research, the super advanced spaces should you know should be about future and you know knowledge and awareness. But actually, the the absolute you bring the opposite um, atmosphere to the conversation, which is basically in a way even these super high-tech spaces of neutrinos or deep deep mines are kind of relics of somehow some sort of um you know like uh, where the, the the knowledge gaps are kind of more profound than the knowledge gained yeah yeah i kind of feel like yeah from the moment maybe they are designed and built already they are ruins for me already somehow they are in the past already or they stand like some kind of empty temples you know because like the research often is being done has been done like let's say higgs boson been found or so on but then that's it, then you need to build another structure again, you know, for the new research. So it's endless. And I think there are like many different paths to discover the same truth. So I would say like Alexandra Koshuba, she wasn't a scientist, but she discovered exact same structures and almost movement 
like what is being researched at CERN, like for example, the symmetry and everything that antimatter, all these um, structures of white holes and black holes, <laughs> symmetries. But I think, yeah, it can be discovered just through our own body. Our own body at the moment is some kind of collider. Like right now, we're sitting all here and we're having this like 10,000 billions of rays and neutrinos piercing through our skin. So it's happening all the time. And I think also continuing with that, with the film Cyrenomelia that started in this scientific research station where I just like wandered alone, you know, every morning would start with tripod, rifle and camera. And it, it's been always bright because of polar day and night. So it was, they were like perfect conditions to film. I think that's where I started to work and collaborate more with scientists from, from that art residency and from Sarah Amelia's film. And since then I continue because I think that's kind of like maybe the method, the way I work. Maybe I don't include all that research. With me. Uh, just an another part of the method. Conversations Sorry, together. Sorry, I didn't want to talk over you. Sorry, another part of the method that, uh, that, that connects in a way, and it relates to a question here, is that actually how you yourself create a role and embody, you know, embody uh, as in, in these spaces. And in a way, the question is, um, is it important that it's you yourself that are the kind of the, 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 the mermaid, the Saren Amelia, the character in that, that, that you, you became you became this up, you became and developed this, this character or creature, not creature, but character. It came out also like, I think naturally because I couldn't find no one else to do it. Even though <laughs> people would be in paid, no one wants to do this, you know, to like lounge that yourself so cold. out at rides. Yeah, and I don't use dry suit because then just two millimeters because you would need a lot of weights then actually to dive deep. So often I end up doing it myself, but I don't think it's so important for me. I think it could be also other mermans swimming in the colliders. It doesn't need to be me. I mean, in truth, it's, I mean, it's certainly it, 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 it does tend to be with it's one lonely figure in, in one or two of the films, but actually in other films, you've worked with others and it becomes much more like uh, a group of people, young people negotiating together, choreographing within these architectures. So, you know, it, it, even with synchronized swimming in, in, uh, in uh, sort of, is it pleasure prospects, where you kind of have a kind of assembly of, of negotiating these architectures, and I, and I think this is something that is recurring of recurring interest is in a way is is um, to go to to a more collective uh, wrestling with these architectures, and and you've been interested in that, I think. Yes, and that's I think all another body of work together with New Mineral Collective, a duo that I have. Together, is a short clip being screened. Maybe seven some installations we have developed together, and Pleasure Prospects was commissioned for the first uh, Toronto Biennial. Mm. And that relates to this. Uh, I mean, on again, counter prospecting. 
Sorry. Sorry, that, I was going to say that relates also to this idea of uh, long term research in extractivism in extraction that you've been collaborating the new mineral uh, collected with Tanya, but that's this idea of extraction that connects back to geology as well this ge uh, geological geological aspect of how we think about time. Uh, but through extraction and through thinking about, um, yeah, petrochemical industries, which was very much the research for pleasure prospects. Yes, the first part of the film. In the World Prospectors Meeting, because Toronto is kind of like capital of stock. alternative headquarters of NMC, more, more relating the prospecting for different values and providing different type of geotrauma healing therapies. So massaging the borders, And also, that's how we worked with And currently we want to uh, combine this index of voices and knowledge sharing, more focusing on counter prospecting and actually um, acquiring the real licenses for prospecting we have for Ontario region. And we basically just keep the land passive. We try to prospect for pleasure and desire and poetry or something else. So that's literally about securing land rights and repurposing, um, but playing with the contracts that are associated with extraction, with the extraction industries. I mean, exploring them um, and doing in a subtle way. Yes. Yes, it's a body of work of several years research and now we're working on publication and also trying to have more new mineral collective members to join so we could keep more land passive. I mean, the interesting locations in terms of you lived up in, in Norway and the idea of, uh, you know, in a way, the, um, countries which um, and, and, and the projects in Canada, countries where um, the oil contracts are, are, have been much debated amongst the population, but then of course you have you know the the, the state state contracts developing their arrangements, which says well actually it's whether it goes against the people or whether um, uh, you know, there can be legislation to stop them selling those contracts. And this is very relevant in, uh, in Norway and uh, also in, 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 in Canada. Yes. And I think we were also in, were interested, like, in studying these maps that are always invisible, all the stratas of the, all the layers of private, federal, indigenous land and how remote and easy actually is this colonial way of not even visiting the land actually you know you can just sit anywhere in the world and like click the cells these little squares and um, 
And I think in Norway, it's been interesting because again, with the first film, Hollow Earth, we were looking at these hidden structures in this kind of chameleon mining technology, leaving out hollowed out mountains, standing like postcards still with their crests, but actually entire mountain is a hollowed out sizes Oslo city, but no one really sees it. Everything is hidden and all the, you know, eco-friendly image hides all these other shady activity, you know? you know? So it's been interesting more like to investigate and deconstruct I did want to ask you about sunken cities because I do think that this comes back to this this profound long term interest in the mythological and the fact that you you have been you know seeking out places which um you know historical places with uh a kind of the kind of hidden archaeological um, un underwater archaeology I mean this, this connects to other pieces as well but the idea that uh, that the sort of that that there's the kind of you know you like you, European myths of of, um, of uh, the mythological um, and and the kind of places that you've been attracted to filming in in, in Italy and um, so that that means there's an extension then of the 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 mermaid character exploring these spaces navigating these hidden hidden spaces and hidden cities. Yeah, exactly. That's um, that's how I've been always planning to start this feature length film, which I'm finally about to finish after six years, Burial, where I researched and focused more on these different sites of nuclear waste. And, and I just um, always envisioned this first into shot. Um, Again, as I mentioned, of this archaeologist landing from the future, but I didn't even like need to create any CGI of fiction because it exists already, you know, in southern Italy. This biggest Roman civilization port, Pozzuoli, and Baia are just. Um, all sunken underwater um, and you could see traces of architecture of houses of streets churches and i've been trying to open these mosaics 2000 years old mosaics and really just to reflect on human scale and history I was just exchanging well with, uh, with Emilia, sorry, about the um, the sites of uh, where these old mosaics are. So, for example, at the the at, at Cape Tenaron in southern Greece, uh, in the Mani, there are some mosaics close to where the um, the 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 reputed mouth of Hades is the kind of mouth of Hades. <laughs> And you, you this week have just been, um, you know, um, reconnoitering and researching uh, the 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 site of the cave of Zeus, so the birth of Zeus. So these are, you know, these are profound uh, spaces that you've been looking at. Um, yeah, trying maybe to grasp this like very very little sand of grain in geological time perspective and human time scale of course we can start from those you know to neutrino colliders but it's still just gonna be you know just a little stalactite geological timeline compared to nature i often like yeah. fas fascinated you know Emilia, do you want to just explain? Because um, a little bit of burial and um, 
sort of is being screened now. Um, the, the, the Igalina is the sort of sister site of Chernobyl, isn't it? And it's in Lithuania. And you've been going back there for, for more than seven years, maybe lo well, longer, and, and going regularly back to film the decommissioning of that site. So this major, major site, which is being decommissioned, it's like, like this kind of connects to this like kind of archaeology of, of industrial archaeology. Um, but is this, the, is, this, is this going to be the com combination in a way with these other, other locations? This is what yours brings in the... Yes, yes. It's a co combination because I found like some architectural and historical similarities. Like for example, how they are planning to bury now entire 3.5 billion radioactive waste in Lithuania. It's basically to just build this hill, you know, some kind of rounded green hill. And it reminds me also these Etruscan burial cities mm -hmm. outside Rome of these rounded domes that you fly above so in a way <clears throat> i envision already in some years we will have this type of nuclear waste burial sites and that's where all these mythologies etruscan mythology connected the this burial sites that we are building now but it's a little bit different because we borrowing uranium, which will, which never can be buried really. So I'm interested in this again, like geological time of uranium decay, which was formed in supernovas and kind of was sleeping calmly in Earth's crust, but after <laughs> humans woke it up now you know, the cycle of digging it out, production, and now burying it, it back, just way more toxic. So just these cycles that sometimes seems a bit like absurd of human it, touch. It does take me back though, to the idea of uh, how the the idea of uh, of frequencies of, of tuned frequencies that you have in this in the closing sequences of Sir and Amelia, where it's it's your you know it's your body but it's creating these the kind of the waves the kind of radiating waves this idea of of um, of frequencies to spaces these other spaces is something that you know recurs in terms of this idea of of um, of how to tune in to the to the frequencies uh, it seems to be mm -hmm. like you're like you're wrestling with how to tune in um and then mm -hmm. how to how to engage and engage as an artist um with you mm -hmm. know super, superstructures i mean you know it's 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 you know it's the anthropocene and the, the kind of hyper objects of course but it's in a way it's the personal it's the personal negotiation um that that i think is fascinating and, and and the um the 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 that that it's not left to uh to to um to explanation it, it's the sensory and the immersive is 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 created as part of it in terms of the way they yeah i think it's always important for me to have these reference points somewhere outside ourselves so also in siren amelia the sound you hear it's actually from dying black holes and quasar stars so here this uh, radio telescope is listening to the white noise of this dying star and why it's listening in order to understand like, like Earth's rotation and tectonic plates movement. So also, I guess, always to understand ourselves, we always need this reference points.
this is why all of this work, uh, including a lot like, and also the presentation that I have of the, of the Great Silence by Alora and Carl Sedilla, it, it, it's, a, it's a literally about the, the idea of a kind of uh, inner listening um, and uh, kind of the idea of echoes um, um, mm -hmm. and, and time and, and navigating time, which is where, where a letter to the future is, is as, a, as, a, as a book that has now developed as On Time and Water by Andrew Snare Magnuson. Is is of, of profound interest to me because, in a way, it talks about the need for artists to be able to use their writing, their metaphors, their mechanisms of of um, of creative production to be able to kind of generate the myths, the myths that we need to 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 come together to wrestle with the predicament, and the predicament is laid out so clearly in in you know in in books, but in, and I'm thinking about Uninhabitable Earth by David, David Wallace Wells, but, but, you know, in a way one needs, rather than just the, the, you need the terrifying, but you also need the constructive and the creative and the, the role that mythology has played in history. You know, we need our new myths, our positive myths to kind of take us through this next, next period yeah yeah exactly what um just write a script for a fiction film more like based in depths of baltic sea and also yeah it's continuing these topics and these creations of myths. I'm planning to visit different neutrino observatories in the ocean, trying to scan sea basin, the photogrammetry, trying to see the faults, the fault lines, trying to use echolocation to create these type of different perceptions frequencies and messages absolutely and and finding new scientists all the time i mean this is the 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 way that you work with scientists and you find ways in which you as an artist you, you kind of make those connections with those scientists that help you along the journey yes and i think always the conversations maybe like sometimes we don't really have really precise dialogue maybe they are going against you know like my ideas of scientific sites as ruins already for them it's not like that but sometimes it, like um yeah more like talking the theoretical astrophysicists and speculating now the like about current new theories of multi-universes and again you know like world with no straight edges and uh, yeah i think it's very fruitful for me just to buy thank you emilia so emilia it's been a pleasure to be able to speak to you today um thanks for staying with it and for dealing with the technology um it, it it's it's been been fantastic to be able to. So I really profoundly want to thank you for, for taking part in this. Um, so thank you indeed. And um, hopefully we can uh, see each other in person and uh, in, in, in very soon. Um, thank you okay. so much. Let's search for new myths and happy to be here. Thank you. Let's okay, see. thank you. Okay, so we're gonna take a, a, um, a five minute break now and hopefully you can rejoin me at 12 o'clock uh, with the, um, where we'll, I'll continue the conversation with uh, Nina and Connie. Um, so please do come back at, at uh, 12, 12 o'clock and we'll join uh, then. Um, but thanks again to Emilia because uh, that's been a fantastic way to get these uh, talks um, going. Okay, all the best and see you soon, thank you. See you. Ciao.
So thanks for coming back and joining us today. I'm Alessandro Vicentelli, and I'm the uh, artistic director and curator for ECO8, uh, A Letter to the Future, a revived edition of the International Triennial of Art and Ecology in Maribor, Slovenia. And uh, over the two days, we've had the opportunity to hear from several of the artists. So now it's the chance to uh, introduce Nina Sleko Blom and Connie Blom, uh, who have a work in the exhibition. And it's been a pleasure to be able to work with the team uh, in, uh, uh, you, uh, Eugene Maribor, who, who know their practice, and, and uh, for me to discover their practice uh, as part of uh, the, the research and project for them. So welcome both. Um, the, we're going to follow the same format, which basically is a very short introduction from me, 20 minutes of uh, presentation from Nina and, and Connie, and then we'll do uh, a, a, like a, a Q&A a, a mediated conversation where we can talk about the, the research areas of the practice. And I'll be, we'll be, I'll be working with colleagues to just uh, check on questions that might come up, which you're welcome to do through the uh, live stream through YouTube and Facebook. But if you put your questions in there, um, we'll be sure to try and um, make sure that they get checked and answered. So um, Nina Sleko Blum is an international contemporary artist currently based in Sweden. Um, her art practice examines really more recently, certainly art world and its institutions and various power structures, working both separately and in a team. Uh, they've made over 250 exhibitions in, in institutions around the world. She's also a member of artist collectives, Pectin and Clara Sachs. And parallel with that artistic practice, that's ongoing practice, at, at, uh, uh, she, which she runs together with Connie Blum, they've set up something called the Conceptual Art Center uh, in Bukieve and Landskrona. And this is a budgetless non-profit pl exhibition platform, which is developing projects with um, upcoming artists, but also has worked with established names, artists like Gillian Waring, Jeremy Della, Ronnie Horn, and Trevor Paglin. Um, in 2017, they also published CAB conceptual art book with financial help from um, uh, actually conceptual art legend, amazing artist, uh, Joseph Pursuit, who I've also had the pleasure to uh, meet and, and uh, talk with in the past. Um, um, so, I mean, Connie, Connie Blum is, is, is from Sweden um, and his artistic practice uh, also, you know, seems to navigate with media uh, and looking at these ideas of alternative readings between uh, the kind of navigation of, um, of meaning and, and, and media. One of the things that has definitely occupied them is censorship and copyright. And, and, um, and also this idea of um, uh, strategies uh, for e ecological questions and that really kind of revolves around um, uh, of, 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 of greenwashing. And, and, and that's something that uh, uh, I'll be looking forward to talking to them um, about later. Um, so as I say, both se you know, working separately and in parallel with Nina uh, Seko Blum, uh, they've worked together on exhibitions um, around. Listen, it's a pleasure to, to welcome you to this to this set of talks. It's kind of the coda week to the to the exhibition. You know, for so many of us, it wasn't possible to get the artists, uh, uh, you know, at the at the opening. So um, as as this as this is coming to a close, it's been great to do these film screenings and these talks. So welcome both, uh, uh, and thank you for joining. Um, so if it's all right, I'm going to pass over to you uh, to introduce. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Alessandro. And uh, you also managed to, to sum summarize basically the first half of our presentation here now. So we, we should basically just skip it. Uh, but um, what I, I have, um, it's always me doing the presentations and Ina will then, will then uh, do the Q&A. Uh, what I will do is to give a little bit of background of Nina's practice only by showing some imagery and basically saying the words that you already said and then uh, we'll go on to our common practices and focus on the, the green drawings project um, uh, so that's what I will be doing and there will be a, initially I just show lots of pictures to, to give you some kind of visual idea of um, uh, Nina's work and then our collaborative work and then we can talk more when we arrive to the the, the green drawings project. So uh, let's see if I can manage to share screen here. Uh, 
and I'm having to wait for the uh, bar to disappear so I can click sleep. Okay, we'll do like this. Like that, yeah. Okay, uh, so initially I would uh, show, uh, is it on, online now? It seems so, I see it in the sound bureau. Uh, uh, Nina started out as a, a conceptual painter and has uh, afterwards, as Alessandro point, uh, mentioned, uh, worked uh, uh, towards um, um, questions of hierarchies within the art world, examining different power structures uh, within the art world, their personal experiences with curators and uh, galleries and so on. And uh, then she, she broadened her uh, perspective away from sort of referring within the art world, discussing the art world, she broadened it to looking at other kinds of power hierarchies also in, the, in her later work, where she's then been working with um, um, I see I'm talking a bit too fast, so I'm going to catch up with the talk here. We still see some works that has been interactions with different institutions and curators and so on, and dialogues. But here we come to a piece that was shown in Maribor, actually, uh, um, that's uh, dealing with ecology. Um, and uh, uh, power structures standing in, in the way of uh, um, uh, pr progress on the front of like trying to stop climate change and such um, with a bunch of dead bees included in the installation here. And this work referring to e EU's um, strat strategies around their borders and the hor horrible Thing that happens when you first uh, cause climate change in the world and then suddenly people are uh, forced to flee and come to Europe to seek seek help and which is not as uh, which is not so popular than to actually take responsibility for your actions we are installed in a sculpture park in Austria uh, this work is a work from this year where you know, in, uh, in relation to a, um, uh, COVID measures and closed institutions and uh, institutions that you could access via the back door made a show that was only accessed via the back door. You had to sneak in from behind a part of the exhibition with new, mainly new artist book works. So that was a very, very quick run through. And now we are uh, up to uh, collaborative works with uh, me. Uh, this project here I thought to show and talk about just a few words because it links to the, the current project in Maribor in the sense that it's, it's a contract. This is a work called Be uh, Bearskin and it deals with the strategy of galleries, collectors, and museum directors who collaborate to push a certain artist. Uh, first you buy lots of work from this artist and then you make sure that this artist is exhibited in the right places since you have the contacts and you have the places and then the galleries rises in fame and the value of the works uh, rise. In this case this is a, a, a play on this uh, strategy where uh, where uh, uh, buying ourselves uh, exhibitions. Uh, th in this case here it's for the Shirayevo Biennial in Mo uh, Russia uh, where we we offer paintings to the curator and uh, what's, what's to be shown in the exhibition is the contract between us and the curator that we are part of the biennial whilst the paintings are the curator's private uh, uh, property and not to be shown in the exhibition so it's a yeah it's a 
pure financial transaction, basically. Um, we get our exhibition and line in Sevilla, and the curator gets our work. The same for uh, Bucharest Biennial here. Um, and I mentioned this work just because we are dealing with sort of a contract where we make an exchange, one, one kind of value for another kind of value, which would then come back to um, in, in uh, when we talk about the green drawings. Uh, another project that we have together is this, as uh, Alessandro also mentioned, uh, Clara Sachs, which is a, a, a collective work that has the appearance of being a, an artist, since it has the kind of name that you might assume it's a person, but it's actually us together. And here we are using the opportunity to work in a different uh, matter than how we work when we're um, uh, in our own, own uh, practices, we're using sort of more. It's less uh, conceptual and more and more um, irrational in in a sense. Where uh, this is a, this the, is the Clara Sachs uh, manifesto, one sentence stolen from talking the Talking Heads: "Stop making sense." Uh, and in this, we have been working a lot with different kinds of contradictions and. Uh, Confusions, mainly, you know, in in an exhibition uh, where we used sounds of a Canadian techno artist uh, that happened to be called Carl Andre. We made ins an installation that was sort of playing with the, the style of Carl Andre, although going gradually cartoonish uh, and ending with some kind of Marge Simpson feet. Uh, and in this case, here's like uh, uh, music equipment connected with also uh, uh, licorice uh, lace. So it's like uh, yeah, just expanding on, on the existing technique in in, in an uh, unfunctional way. Some other installation shots from Clara Sachs uh, exhibitions. Uh, this show we did in Schutz Gallery in Ljubljana and. Clara Sachs usually works uh, site specific. Schutz Gallery is known to have been a bakery before uh, uh, it was uh, a gallery. So that's sort of the obvious thematics. But then it happens that the Slovene artist Matej Andras Mogrincic had, had already made a show where he turned the gallery back to a bakery. Uh, so we couldn't do that. But uh, instead, we borrowed all books on baking, bread, and Matej Andras Vogrincic from all the libraries in Ljubljana. So we like removed the history of this from access in the libraries and exhibited. The books are in the boxes there in the gallery. And uh, 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 so what we exhibited was uh, all the books on baking uh, bread and Matej Andras Vogrincic, but unavailable. Uh, so that was our, our way of dealing with that. The obvious idea was already done. We removed the uh, the backstory, sort of. Uh, so some sort of play with censorship there. Uh, some other works here again with confusion. We we made a show thematic on the ba uh, Bauhaus uh, hundred years. Uh, we made a show completely with stuff bought in Bauhaus, the, the construction market. And then as uh, another, another part of our practice is this institution that we run completely without budget. Uh, so it very much is sort of uh, in between a, a convention art institution and, and a social art project. Uh, we're finding ways of working outside economy, basically, since we don't have one. Uh, and uh, we started out in Bukwe in Slovenia, a mountain village, where we just started making exhibitions. Here we see the, the venue. <laughs> We didn't have a venue, that's why it's called Conceptual Art Center. 
Because the art center has an idea, not the center for conceptual art. So we just put design on the family house and started making exhibitions. That's fantastic. <laughs> I really like that. Uh, yeah, so we started making exhibitions in uh, just the kitchen, the living room, and using all the different spaces in the house. Um, and simple equipment, the laptop to show videos on. Then we happened to have a, a projector also, so we could have video screens also. And Nina's father had a work workshop, so we could use that also for bigger installations. First ever show, solo show with Jonathan Messi in Slovenia. Then uh, we had to relocate to Sweden uh, and so then we brought the center with us as an open and annex in our apartment here in Landskrona. Started with a show with Martin Creed. Uh, it's light going on and off in a, was one of the works exhibited in our apartment here. Landskrona is a small, sleepy, and boring uh, town in southern Sweden. Um, yeah, Jeremy Deller, different works. We also started doing uh, curatorial projects outside uh, our own venue here. We are in Estonia with a project based on Mel Bochner's old project that we, we made, invited new artists to uh, participate in a uh, remake of Bochner's original piece. Um, Bochner we invited also, so he, he participated with his old pages. And the same, um, we did the old Joseph Kosut piece, this uh, 50 people present their favorite book, where we invited Kosut to participate, which is where we then got in contact with him and how we then could finance this book that we published and gave away for free, uh, keeping it as a gift economy all through. And then we have arrived to uh, the the green drawings project, uh, and this is the the first um, um, version of the project that was exhibited. It was exhibited in uh, Msum in Ljubljana, where we had 240, 200, 240 drawings, small green drawings, made the simplest possible way uh, with a big felt pen, uh, and the, what we were interested in here was the the so, sort of neoliberal logic that controls uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, within EU. The idea that emissions should cost and you should sell emission rights and by making it all a market, the market will self-control and it will like emit less. Uh, only problem is that there has been way too many emission rights, so there hasn't been any uh, initiative to to uh, minimize. But anyhow, it also shows how maybe to let the market, we have seen in many other instances, to let the market itself control uh, um, uh, and limit climate change hasn't been so successful, the market uh, manipulates the emission uh, numbers from their cars and says that if we emit this little, this car is really good, and then the car sells a lot, and then it turns out that uh, this only works in the laboratory, this kind of emissions, and if you ma manipulate the situation to zero resistance and whatnot. So it's like there's obviously so that you can't trust uh, a profit-based uh, uh, system uh, to fix uh, the climate problem. Um, so, that, that, but here we when what we were doing here was that we were selling uh, symbolically affecting uh, uh, emissions by selling uh, these drawings, and for the price of, for the drawings, uh, we bought emission rights that was cancelled out. So. During this uh, um, exhibition, the, we uh, cancelled out 200 tons of 
uh, carbon dioxide from the market, which is in the end nothing. And uh, uh, it shows on the possibility, but it also shows that that uh, there is some the, the system is rigged to not really um, uh, be that it's there for show, but it doesn't really do what it's supposed to. Um, we continued with this um, project in in the form of performance, where we again were selling these uh, drawings. And this time, it, we were planting trees in. Uh, uh, Central Africa um, for the uh, price of the, the drawings and in this performance uh, I am sort of creating intentionally creating guilt among the, the viewers by talking I mean making comparisons of different different kinds of emission uh, in this uh, exhibition ex uh, exhibition project outdoors project that you basically had to take a car to get to. I talked about how much, how big part of emissions cars were. And I also talked about the fact that what we're doing here now using internet, the internet consumes as much or produces as much, as much carbon dioxide emissions as the whole international uh, airplane freight and tra transport and uh, um, uh, people and stuff, transport, whatever you call it. Uh, air traffic and uh, internet traffic uh, produces as much emissions. Basically, by looking at uh, uh, funny cat clips, you're consuming enormous amount of uh, um, uh, carbon dioxide in the long run. So, I, but I also sort of, so it was sort of a play with this personal guilt, but at the same time, it did, where in this project we are also very well aware of that it's not really so that the indivi individual, uh, the per each person cannot change things. It has to be done from uh, um, the the main institution, states, and such for it actually to work. But we are all the time uh, fed this sort of how we have to live differently. Uh, and when people couldn't fly due to Corona, it turned out first it was they were talking about how clean the air is everywhere and such. But then it turned out it was maybe two to five percent less emissions uh, last year, which is again then very, very, very little. So if we all stop flying, we are still not reaching any kind of goals, and it's it has it's a structural problem. It has to be dealt from a state and international uh, level down, and not from not only from people up. Uh, but this, so the, the, here in this case, we are playing with those back and forth with those like personal guilt and uh, um, societal responsibilities, and this in turn became. Uh, was included in this was also a soundtrack, uh, and we uh, made an uh, issue of uh, this uh, soundtrack on CD, where you also got the booklet with the whole script for the performance. Um, and that you could we were then offering online uh, in an in a as an online event that you could write to us about with your. Uh, what kind of uh, climate friendly action you would make uh, to uh, get one of these discs. So we were offering the discs uh, against climate friendly actions, uh, which is then also the what we went the, the way we went on uh, in the Corona Gallery in Ljubljana, where we had the first version of this sort of contract on the uh, um, where where you have where you can sign a paper what what you're doing or will do uh, for the climate uh, and take one drawing in this case it was a, a small installation where the drawings ha hang on one hook and the papers signed papers uh, the yeah were hanging on the other hook 
And this, I like I like this image very much because of the the connection then back to the the politicians uh, who who make decisions. Uh, uh, in a way, it's an art, uh, artistic process, uh, like in front, but actually you've got to be acutely aware of uh, the way that you know power and politicians make decisions, and it's there in the the kind of fragmented images, but it's it's there also in, in your design concept for the for books or production. Exactly. The, the, with each of these meetings, when they meet and decide on measures that are never enough, they always applaud themselves in the end, which is a, um, it's, it's a, for me, I, I, don't, I don't usually applaud myself, but they always do in these meetings. And it's, uh, uh, we're using this image also, because there's something a little bit weird, but it's like, uh, one is so content with one's actions that, one, that it's natural that one applauds oneself. Uh, yeah, uh, might be for camera, but still, uh, it's a weird thing. Um, yeah, so this, uh, from this uh, exhibition, we then got these uh, texts uh, from visitors to the gallery that we then made this book of, uh, which is then what has been exhibited uh, in uh, Echo 8. Uh, as this installation, uh, 200 copies uh, mounted on the wall. And uh, again, a paper where you can uh, write what uh, climate friendly actions you will make in change of a copy of the book. So it's an artist book in exchange for that you uh, write down what, what kind of climate friendly action you could consider making. To get a copy of the book, and uh, so this, I we don't know the current today status of it, but this is something about how I think it looks like, like right now. I counted to that we're down to. I think we have fifth. Some day ago, we had fifty-four books left uh, of the of the. Uh, I stepped four, yeah. Of the issue. Just just before you move on, Connie, just yeah. just to go back. It, so uh, what I would bring out, though, is how uh, how important it is as a process that evolves over the course of the exhibition. Um, similarly, like last year, you know, at the at, at some the, but the idea that uh, over the course of an exhibition, the pro, the there's a transaction and an exchange, so things are shifting and changing, and that that can be documented. So uh, and that there's a sort of there's a kind of um, there's a kind of um, yeah, an unfolding through the project uh, of, of of the result and in terms of people's people's responses. So so what what we have there is pledges, and even in the first three days there were remarkable pledges just uh, that turned up on on the on the wall um, uh, in relation to being able to sort of say make a commitment and 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 and, and make a response. And in a way, uh, you know, you're tongue in cheek, but you know, your your approach is 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 clearly aware of the ironies and the of the process of the art world. But actually, uh, you shouldn't underestimate. Well, me personally, it, it's you shouldn't underestimate how actually having a, a generative process like this in this installation, uh, it, it does work extremely well, really well. I mean, we do think that. Absolutely, that it's uh, um, it's really great. That I think it makes uh, people think, and obviously, like it becomes this uh, board instead of different kinds of ideas. Everything from quite silly suggestions to very uh, um, serious suggestions, like what people are thinking to do. So I think it's uh, it's uh, both very inspiring and uh, uh, sociologically interesting. Um, process what, what happens from like first the neat book installation to instead to have this all these documents of uh, it's document of the time all the people at the same time and from mainly the same place but uh, the region uh, at a certain time what what are their thoughts in the matter where the work turns from one uh, installation to another through through the exhibition I think it's uh, uh, it was obviously the fault in the previous version of the project where we didn't totally consider the pledges 
as something to be visible in the exhibition because they were piled on top of each other. You could only read the previous pledge. Uh, then we made the book to compensate for that. But uh, we think that this is, uh, um, yeah, um, of course, a much more successful way of doing it because I think also uh, only to read what everybody has written is uh, is giving some, making the work so, so such uh, become so much more. At the same time, I also I like to think about all the people who have taken these books with them. Is it making a difference in that? Is, do you hear me okay? If you come a bit closer, even a bit closer. Better. Uh, Better. I wanted to say I like to think about all the people who have taken the books with them. That's part of the work as well because they go home and hopefully have a little bit different awareness or it opens up other for other thoughts because I'm not, I'm not sure how much everybody's thinking about these matters yet but after seeing the show and bringing a souvenir with them maybe we're altering awareness slightly with it the same with the show in Ljubljana where we, people couldn't read other people people's pages but they got a drawing with them which maybe I like the work is the way it can alter I mean, I, I think the work still lives when it's in people's homes. I like that mm. part of it. It's, uh, it, but it's also a solidarity economy. I mean, it, it connects, it's a reciprocal, and a, it's like an exchange. And in a way, you're, you're maybe more, a few years ago, you're maybe more strategic, like questioning of markets in a way. It can relate back closely more to personal acts. I mean, uh, um, and uh, a kind of a, a process of um, uh, a process of journeying somewhere through through having the book and having a conversation. And I think I know from the team uh, at, in Maribor UGM that the, the the conversations that people have in front of the work uh, uh, are really rewarding. So that the the the, um, the the invigilators, the team, the, the team doing workshops, uh, they they really enjoyed having. Uh, uh, seeing the responses, uh, you know, with with the work. Mm. It's really nice to hear too. Mm. Mm. We are rather cynical, maybe people, but but it's nice to see that <laughs> that that maybe we can contribute. Yeah, at least to the conversations, because we don't we, even having our little daughter. We don't just want to think that everything is doomed. We would like to think otherwise. Mm. And I think what Connie was trying to say with that this personal guilt, I think that this is something that politicians are feeling us because it's better that we feel guilty rather than being angry with them. But I think I'm, I still think that is that people shouldn't shouldn't feel guilty. They should change their ways a little bit, perhaps, mainly in the way they vote. I think <laughs> I think that's where our strength and power is. But um, yeah, and I, absolutely, it is. Uh, I, I don't think that it actually will uh, save the world if somebody decides to buy a monthly car for the uh, bus instead of taking his car. But uh, if he also is, uh, starts thinking about these questions so much that he makes such an action, then he might also consider uh, when he goes to vote and also the demands on politicians might change. And of course, we're, we're talking very small scale here with 200 books at one location and 200 books there and such, but uh, still it's, it's, a, it's a way, this, a way if the more people are aware of the questions, the more they will de demand that the politicians are not only mocking about and pretending to do things. Uh, so that, that is definitely like the positive, uh, uh, a positive part of the project that it still has, even if Maybe the, the individual actions might not save things, but the awareness you 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 might you create by to for yourself perhaps by doing them uh, is perhaps the like the the, the hopeful way it forwards. I mean, you were about to then show your the more recent project, which I think is also the. Carry on. Yeah, right. This is the. Um, uh, I mean, the project project we did for uh, Echo Eight was finalized just for Echo Eight, of course, 
But after that, uh, we have now done the, one more exhibition with the green project. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, it's based on the this. Uh, the uh, I don't know re exactly what group group in this is, but this um, um, bulletin of scientists has started for a, a, a long time ago to making these calculations based on the state of the world. How, how far from doomsday we basically are, how, how far from the end of the world as we know it. And uh, it has changed and due to, yeah, through the years, the Cuba crisis and different situations have changed. Gradually, the environment has become an awareness in these calculations also. And we're currently at the uh, uh, latest time uh, uh, since they started with this clock, uh, which is uh, 100 seconds from midnight. Uh, and what we've done here is just a set of green drawings done on top of uh, scans of our little daughter's uh, drawings, our one year and eight month old daughter. Uh, so it has this, I mean, uh, suddenly it becomes really very real what we are drawing here is like this our little daughter is uh, has her whole life in front of her and uh, right now uh, a group of important scientists thinks that we're closer to doomsday than we've ever been before due to the situation with the climate and that sort of the, the implications for us personally but also for the world uh, and again, it's simply it's simply created through uh, the the thick green felt pen, but also here you're using the digital clock, like the doomsday clock, um, with um, with uh, yeah, uh, with different different dates. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, this is combination of print and the drawing. Ah, yeah, yeah. print. Uh, yeah. Right, so this is the, the, um, the very last. Uh, what will happen next is of course that. Uh, now we'll have a new batch of uh, uh, pledges uh, from uh, from the Echo 8, and that mm. seems obviously to be the next book. Um, yeah, so um, uh, that's something. I think, something I think that, the you know everyone's it's the personal journey to you as a family as well. It's 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 interesting. It's not never it's a fascinating one to navigate, but this is an interesting one in which actually. Uh, you can, one can, one can um, put put out there um, like a, a personal sense in which actually you're thinking about different generations, your child, what what will they inherit, and this connects it uh, really eloquently actually um, uh, in that way. So it's, it's, that's a hundred seconds to midnight, isn't it? That, that one. Yeah. 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 It's been it, since 2018. They haven't, they haven't yeah, them. it's 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 fascinating. It's the Cold War. It's it off. It mostly was associated, wasn't it, with the, with with scientific um, physics in terms of the the Cold War, um, the Cuba crisis. Um, but uh, we're absolutely aware that it's supplanted by a, um, a, a climate uh, planetary related crisis uh, rather than anything else. It, 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 it's it's worth picking up on the just the um, you know you you have a phrase don't you while the planet was burning we were drawing and doing swapsies that uh, you use the phrase doing swapsies as in, in terms of almost like artists this is what you do you swap with each other um, and and there's a kind of, I, I, there's a you know there's an irony there of course but actually um, you know the it's something that it's something that um, you find you do find spaces to 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 go beyond the irony. This is something I was going to try and say. We, we hope so. We try to. We try to. Mm. Um, I, 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 relating back to something, I remember note, making a note of something called notes on the indulgence trade. It, um, what what did that relate to? Was that was that similarly the group in relation to the pledges? Notes on the indulgence trade. Is that base? Is that relating to bearskin? 
not very scary. We're calling that was the name of the performative version where where I thought it's a it's a um, basically a lecture and a uh, performance in, in lecture form okay. where I uh, talk about uh, uh, yeah different aspects based uh, and the play uh, the uh, indulgence trades is so that's what I mean calling the, uh, mm. the both buying our green drawings as like it's sort mm. of like can be uh, you can buy yourself free of guilt uh, in a sense but also the whole uh, um, uh, emission right trade is some sort of like it's a bit that since, since it, it actually is not doing what it's supposed to it is uh, in a way in a way an indulgence trade you just buy yourself free of guilt now i can uh, continue business as usual uh, just going to draw in because i remember from look it, it is true that um in the past there's a question basically that relates to the idea that actually you in the past that you 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 have referred to other artists and like um, uh, other other art histories in terms of the traditions um, and the, one of the, the questions is are you burdened by the legacy of art or does it fill you with joy and inspiration and possibility so that joy and inspiration yeah I I well, that, yeah. That, you? that's good. Um, because obviously in the past, I mean, there's a sense in which actually the art world structures, you you know, you were navigating, there was a kind of a questioning of, um, of, of, of kind of the, um, the, you know, sort of the taste structures, taste and, um, you know, how, what is, what is bought, what's sold, the bulls and the roosters, for example, is very clearly very much about, you know, the one gallery is saying, well, actually, red cells, you know, not blue, uh, these type of animals, not this. And, and in a way, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's conceptual interventions as, as artworks, as paintings. But, but in a way, what's, in, what's interesting is in relation to that question, coming back to the idea that uh, does it fill you with joy and inspiration? That, that's good. That's good that we can find, find ways to go forward. Um, 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 uh, that, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, a question for Nina is, uh, the, the green books were supported by a company producing green passive houses. You know, it's a, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, and this was something that was slightly support, you know, negotiated through, through the team at UGM because we, we needed to raise support to make things happen. You know, how, how do you consider the questions around uh, supports and sponsorships? We have had, had a choice. I would prefer to do everything with my own money, but then I would just not be able. I, mean, I don't have that choice. I don't have the money. So I would be completely invisible. My voice wouldn't be heard. So I, I somehow, it's a, it's a difficult question. But mm. in this case, I'm very glad they supported us because we have made the work that works. People are responding well to it. I think we're giving back something. What? What we're losing in the process, it's complicated, but I, I we need them, I think. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I can say a little bit, we do, we, we often choose to be poor or to work with very little money because it gives us this freedom to do, to really speak our voices. We don't, we don't like compromises with our conceptual art center. Everything has been done the way we wanted to do it because when money isn't involved, you have fantastic freedom but there's limitations with it of course you can't make a book without the money just the print place <laughs> we want their money and yeah some kind of negotiation between that's good i, I, I could see that there is fantastic freedom in having uh, the budgetless art space uh, um in terms of the way that you can then you can make your choices you can bring you can bring uh you know you can bring a supportive network of your own uh, other artists who share those interests but then you know the questions of uh of how yeah how you how you get visibility and if you yeah. want to make publications and all of that and but 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 by making the commitment to the space that's 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 a that's an important thing that you've done 
and, and moved it from Slovenia to uh, Landskrona. It's, it's very portable. It goes, it goes where we go. Back, oh, it's in both places. <laughs> yeah. It's There's a question here, which uh, it says, it's simple. It says, are there good investments in art? Maybe, maybe not better quote for this. We, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, I mean, obviously, financially, for some people, definitely. You can invest in art if you know how you can make gigantic money. But it's nothing that, uh, that I, know how to do and, and it somehow uh, it also takes away everything that's exciting about art as far as i'm concerned i'm not in it for the financial gain and i'm not the one to talk about much yeah i would say that uh, when when you talk about uh, investments and art it's not then it could just as well have been uh, sports cars or uh, uh, sneak uh, 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 sneak, sneakers or whatever uh, thing you can collect that's valuable uh, and uh, it's i mean then it's just an uh, art as a as a, as a uh, pro produce that that is there for uh, uh, instead of gold ingots or something it's like it's not it doesn't matter that it's art anymore and it's suddenly it's irrelevant uh, as an art discussion in a way No, that's, I don't have an answer to that one either. I think uh, that's, uh, that's a good one. Um, just in, uh, during this Corona time, you were able to make this exhibition. Um, um, uh, were you able to, uh, were you able to get, like, were you able to get visitors to come um, to make that happen in the, going through that backspace? Um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's good. They, you, you know, the 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 it does seem to be that the um, the keep calm and carry on, uh, which which we very much associate well in the UK with a particular type of poster uh, relating to the you know to the war, but in a way that with the way that you had um, you had um, totally uh, reworked it in relation to to. Uh, uh, the posters keep calm and carry on in terms of with the EU uh, sort of uh, colors, the blue and the yellow. Um, but that 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 that's that's been part of a, a sort of developing installation that you've done in in a, in, a, in a couple of places. Is that right? No, actually, I only made sketches and offered it around. Nobody wanted it. It's only it's, it's all the inspired in Austria, but that's the only place where they wanted it. Mm. I, I, I obviously really I mean the, in the past the, the, there was a connection to back to the borders which was super interesting but now I think you the the yeah I think the, these colors are, 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 dif are difficult to use as it were in relation to uh, large with large presentations within galleries because you just say well that blue and yellow is too too you know uh, government corporate in that sense um, but uh, yeah but the, 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 the language I think is is relevant and it, it's in keeping with your your attitude as it were in terms of saying actually there are things running in parallel here what the heck how do we get how do we keep these two things you know um you know when actually it's not about it's not about carrying on i mean as in there's a lot more to be done faster so, so, so and actually i think the poster is as current as ever or more maybe i it took me quite a long time to understand that Europe isn't this fantastic place that I thought it was. And I it was very awesome. private, almost shock to notice, but I don't live in this wonderful unity. And 
this poster comes from, you know, you see it on Max with the British flag because it's this joke to yeah. Brits with the stiff upper lip during the Second War just carrying on. And yeah. it felt like the whole Europe is carrying on. We're all so happy. We live in this fantastic place. And I think that this poster needs to be seen <laughs> and, and people should uh, stop at it. That's good. I mean, the, there's a, there's definitely a room for for strategic uh, uh, use of billboards, for example. But uh, those messages, yeah, I could see it. But uh, it's uh, and um, um, there is a there's a strong graphic design interest in in your ongoing practice. So which which leads also to the way that you can collaborate with others. And this is something that is important to both you know both of you is to collaborate with other others to continue things. Um, so that can be designing art books together. We 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 are now can think lately later years we haven't collaborated with other artists, but I, I find that exciting as a thing very much. So it's it hasn't have we done something recently? But we've also been uh, uh, much less mobile during this year. So. Yeah, maybe also having a one-year-old little one. <laughs> For me, but otherwise, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I don't think that's something we're doing more of. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, no, that's good. So, um, if there aren't any other questions, I, I'm, I just like to thank you both for for joining today, for taking part in this, uh, these series of uh, of talks. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Connie. Um, it's been a pleasure to hear you talk about the work. Like I say, at the end of the exhibition, there'll be the photographs that document the process, uh, you know, which will show the, 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 the wall and how it's changed. And uh, I can be sure, you can be sure that all 200 books, I'm sure, will, will have passed on to good hands. Um, yeah, so thank you both again. Thanks for, for sharing the work. And, and I, I want to work with you again in, in, in the future. Um, so, yeah, with that, thanks very much. Um, please come back and join us uh, tomorrow uh, as we'll have two more talks uh, from, um, uh, uh, from, from, from Laura Harrington, a uh, UK artist, and Danai Stratu, a Greek artist. And this will be starting at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, and we'll do follow the same format. It'll be 11, 11 till 12 and then 12 till, uh, till, 12 till 1. So once again, thanks to the UGM team for uh, helping to make this happen for the Eco8 project. It's the last week of Eco8 uh, in Maribor. Um, please do go and see it if you can. Um, thanks very much. Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.